thank you. Uh, those were wonderful talks, and um, I'm 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 jealous of the uh, the ability of, of of both Dick and 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 Jamie to conceptualize and to, and to to see these issues as they developed uh, over the past almost 20 years. I I've been more like the fellow with a dustpan and a broom that follows the elephant around in the in the circus, and mainly simply reacting to the technology as it, as it changed and, and as we had to cope with it as, as federal judges. So I, I was chief judge of the Eastern District of California, which had the highest weighted caseload per judge in the nation at the time when we made the transition from paper filing to electronic case filing. You'll hear um, that called ECF or CMECF. I was chair of the Civil Rules Committee when we drafted the rules for electronic discovery, e-discovery. And then I was chair of the Standing Committee of Rules and Practice and Procedure, which is the umbrella committee for all of the rules committee committees when the e-government act went into effect and required that each one of the rules committees, the bankruptcy rules committee, the criminal, civil, appellate, and evidence committees issue new rules under the e-government act to deal with the problems of, uh, well, to preserve privacy essentially if, if court records are to be made to be made public. I thought um, it would bear beginning here just simply to, to say how far and how quickly we've come in the, in particularly in the federal court system, which is what I, what I know best. I, I don't, um, I won't represent that what I say here t uh, this morning is true of all the state court systems because they're extremely varied and they're, um, and, and it would be difficult to generalize. But it is true now that in all federal courts, that all opinions, all local rules, all standing orders, all orders of judicial officers are free and in a very short period of time have been put up on court websites and are freely available to anybody um, anywhere in the world. And very few cases are sealed. And so this means that there's a wealth of information up on the web. Every, any action by any federal officer, any federal judicial officer that is memorialized in writing is freely available and, and generally speaking, relatively easily available. Uh, if you go to a court website, you'll, you'll notice right away um, that most of them are, are pretty unsophisticated. They're not, they're not nice to look at. Um, courthouses are uh, not uh, well staffed. Uh, in the Eastern District of California, and I'm sure it's true around the country. We don't have web designers. Uh, you don't generally get nice music when you go to a court website, uh, and you often don't find your way around all that easily. But the judges are very aware of the fact that they have an obligation under the E-Government Act to make uh, their opinions available. And this, all of this happened very, very quickly, and, and interestingly, it was the courts that had the most volume that were the quickest and the first to, to go digital. So it was the bankruptcy courts that led the way. And then the district courts. And then followed by the fusty, rule-bound, and frankly, not altogether that busy, appellate courts, um, which are, are the ones that are, are now the last to go. And, to some extent, kicking and screaming, and why would that be? Um, because it, it's so much more manageable when you think about what an appellate court does. Um, so I don't say that the websites couldn't benefit from improvement, but I will say that in a very short period of time, we've come an extraordinarily far way. Now, the PACER system um, applies to the actual filings in a docketed case, and so if you, so we're not talking any longer about court actions, opinions that a judge would write. Those are all free. You don't need to worry about the PACER system. You just go to the website of the court and you can, you can find those opinions. Um, but if you, if you want to get into the actual filings, so somebody files a brief or file, makes a, a motion or uh, submits a certain packet of discovery that, uh, that the party may want uh, the judge to look at or simply wants to put into the record. Uh, that, there is a charge for that. The, the first $40 a year are free, 
and this is a this is a, a I think relatively new thing, and 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 one can expect that 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 sum of money will go up each year. That is to say, it'll be the first one hundred dollars, the first two hundred dollars, something of that sort. Uh, but Congress has required that the courts charge a fee, and it's it's been done per page, uh, so it's eight cents per page. After that, forty free dollars, and. But, but with that, anybody can go into a, a docketed case and, and look at anything, um, unless it's been sealed. And they're very, I can just tell you that there are very few sealed records. This is a, sealing is a, is a topic all unto itself. We can talk about it um, at, at, at length if you like. There are members of Congress and members of the Senate who are very focused on sealing, but all the studies show there's very little sealing that goes on. Settlements are not sealed in the federal system, they're simply not filed. Uh, and I want to come back to that point um, it's, uh, later. So all records are, in fact, public. You do have to pay for them if beyond the $40. And um, the vast majority of the users of the system uh, don't need to go beyond $40. Credit card companies, um, people who are interested in, in mining this data, uh, some public interest groups are going to go beyond that. Um, but but most individuals will will not. Now this this is not to say that there's been any change in in what happens at the courthouse. So just as in the old days, you could go down to the clerk's office, you could drive to Raleigh and say, "I'd like to see the the court file in case number 89-405," and they would bring you out the file, and you could just sit there and look at it. You can still do that. It won't be in paper but they'll put you at a computer terminal and you can, you know, you can look at anything and it's free. Uh, but you have to get there and, and th that we all recognize that that's inconvenient. But, but it's, th there's been no change. All of these records are in fact public and so if you wish to drive around every courthouse in the country, you could take a look at every file that they had. Now the, the fee is not something that the courts are particularly wedded to, although the way Congress has set it up, uh, there is a benefit to the, to the courts from the fee. That is, the fee pays for the PACER system. And as Carl may mention to you, the courts have used some of that money, uh, which exceeds what's needed to run the actual PACER system, to fund some courthouse technology. Um, it's not courthouse technology like, you know, the courthouses have great technology and, uh, you know, we have wonderful acoustical sound systems or anything like that. You're talking about pretty basic stuff. You're talking about actually having a courtroom where, um, you know, a witness can testify uh, remotely, for example. You know, you have somebody up in Alaska and here you are in New York and, and everybody agrees that the, there's no, no point in having the, the witness travel, but you want to have the person, you know, appear on a screen so the jury can see it. Uh, you know, costs costs a certain amount of money, and Congress has not been generous with technology funds. So these are these are collected from the the pacer fee. Um, you could do it differently. Um, Carl could go to Congress and say, "Look, why don't you provide the courts with a technology budget, and then we wouldn't have to charge a pacer fee." And and I think actually most judges would be fine with that. Would have absolutely support it. Um, is it unfair to charge a fee? That is to say, you know, should, should we just consider that everything that is put into a courthouse as a depository, that everybody should freely have access to that? Is that, is that is, as a matter of social policy, do we think that that's unfair? Well, there, there are a few things to think about here. Um, it's, it's not that different than what we had before uh, we had all this wonderful digital access. Uh, so before, if, if you were well-to-do or well-funded, and, or you were just bizarre, and you wanted to go around every courthouse and see what was cooking at, at each place, you could do that. And it would cost money, it would take time, it would be difficult, but you could do it, or you could hire people to do it. If you were the New York Times and you wanted to keep tabs on what was going on in the Los Angeles Federal Court and New York Southern District and Eastern District, and you wanted to have somebody there when, when cases were filed, you could do that. You could, you could pay for it, and, and people did. And other people didn't have the, f the funds or the time or the interest or the means uh, to do this, and, and they would do it on a more selective basis. Well, that's, that's still the case. Um, what about the civil justice system? Is this a public good? Well, in some ways it is. Uh, we tend to pay for most things in the federal system, although this is not 
not universally the case. We, d we don't provide lawyers free of charge to civil litigants who can't afford them, and many of the litigants in federal court have no lawyers, and that's, that's an issue that I'll come back to. Um, how strong is the public-private distinction in, in, in these kinds of records that, that, that I'm now talking about. Remember, everything the judge does uh, that's reduced to writing will be freely available. That's an opinion, it must be made available. But the litigants, these are not government actors, and so if I'm a litigant and I decide uh, I want to file a copy of um, Jamie Boyle's book, I can do that. And then of course, Jamie wouldn't care if it were freely available to, to anybody on the PACER system, um, and he would see that he'd probably actually make money off of that eventually. But, you know, other people might care. Or, um, you know, perhaps I have photographs of somebody in a compromised position, and I just think that it would be neat to file them in this case, and, and I do, and they become available to anybody around the world. Now, is that government activity? Um, is it? Well, you know, you could argue it, I suppose. You, you, the argument for considering it to be a, a, a government document is that there may be judicial action eventually predicated on that document. Um, and so in that sense, it's like the, the, the judge's <coughs> opinion because it relates to the judge's opinion. On the other hand, it's, it's, it's not something that, that the judge ordered to be done, wanted to be done, participated in the filing, or anything of that sort. So is it a public record? Is it a private record? Do we have the same feelings about the strength of access? Should the public pay for somebody to have free access to a document of that sort? I, th I think there's some, some questions about that. And then keep in mind that what we're running basically in the civil justice system in this country is a settlement system. And so most of the cases, 95% something like that of the civil cases that are filed in a courthouse are going to be settled. And of that, of that they, they won't go to trial. And they may not even go to any kind of motion. They'll be filed, and after a period of about six months, they'll simply be over. They'll be settled. There won't be any judicial action. There, all the government will have done is simply to have been a receptor of filings. Now, does a public right of access get triggered? Uh, do we think that the public should actually spend money to make these filings freely available. Uh, it, does this implicate some of the values that, that Jamie was talking about? It seems to me it's more attenuated. Um, and then you have to consider that there are other needs in the, in the, in the system. Is this, is this a priority? Or, or would we think that, well, maybe providing lawyers in some cases and we should put our dollars there? It depends on, on how, um, you know, how, how we want to spend our, our money. Uh, the, there are analogs to what I'm talking about under the old system. We, we changed Rule 5 when I was chair of the Civil Rules Committee, which talks about whether discovery should be filed in the courthouse. And I, I wasn't alert to the issue, frankly, until we published the, the rule for, for comment. And, and what, what was happening is that discovery was being filed in, in massive cases, and courthouses simply didn't have the space for it. Um, uh, truckloads of documents. And so by local rule, most of the courts were saying you don't file discovery until the, um, the judge tells you to file them, tells you to file it. But when we published the rule, many of the newspapers objected because once the discovery is within the four walls of the building, then the public right of access is triggered, and so this becomes a source of information. But again, is, are they government records in any, in any sense that is meaningful, or is this just simply um, sort of private information or private documents being put into a government warehouse? And the rule was changed because courthouses simply couldn't, couldn't handle it. And I think that to the extent that uh, digital filing become, places burdens on the courts, you'll see the same, you'll see the same tension. You'll see courts... Um, you'll see courts saying, don't file that. We, don't file that until I tell you to file it, because it simply creates problems for the, for the courts once it's within the four walls of our computer system. So uh, those are some things to think about. Now, um, I think we're over the period where, where judges were resistant to the notion that everything that they do should be available <laughs> on the web 
free of charge through our court system. I will say you would probably see some battles in the states over this. There's a kind of a culture that you should be aware of that that is um, that pushes back a bit on this, and it has to do with some of the history that that, that Dick was talking about in the sense that there's too much out there already. Uh, so there was a huge battle in the federal courts that I was involved in, and 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 then Judge Alito as well, uh, with me on the on a pu unpublished so-called unpublished opinions and whether they could be cited or not, and and many of the strands that Dick was talking about were were implicated there, where judges would say, I I like to issue uh, opinions that are so-called so unpublished opinions, even though they are now published, even though they are now freely available, but they're second-class citizens. I don't want to hear about them in the future. And, and th this was um, a device that appellate courts were using, uh, sometimes probably to secure agreements on opinions that um, where one judge would say, well, I'll go along with it if it's unpublished, non-precedential, can't be cited back to us. Um, or perhaps they just weren't too content with the lawyering in the case. Gee, you know, this is an important issue, but the briefs we're getting, they're, they're lousy, and uh, we don't want to write an opinion that is going to bind the court in the future on the basis of this kind of record. Or maybe they just felt um, under the gun for time, or they didn't think the, the uh, issue was terribly important. They didn't want to... Uh, it's just a process of triage in the courts. We're just not going to spend that much time worrying about how, what, what our how our language might apply in future cases. This is not not the case to worry about it. So don't don't cite it back to us. And then for district judges, where nothing that a district judge like like uh, like I was, nothing is precedential. Doesn't even bind you in future opinions. Although it might be bad form to say, well, uh, you can only say a few times. Gee, you know, uh, as Frankfurter once said, you know, I, uh, that was that was me when I was stupid, and now I'm smart, and uh, that's uh, it's a, s a sign of wisdom that uh, you no long, you know, you've learned something. Well, you don't want to be that judge too often, uh, who just says, "Well, that was last year. Uh, this year, I'm so much smarter." Of course, the reverse might be true, and um, <laughs> but but. District judges like to be able to say, gee, I think I did a really good job on this opinion and it'll be really helpful and I'm sending it for publication. And so there was a transition period there where district judge opinions were all of a sudden they were appearing in Westlaw and Lexis and in other places and they would say, I didn't give permission for this to be published. I, I, I don't understand this. And what, what they were worried about was that other judges primarily would think that the judge, the author, had actually sent it to Westlaw and therefore had vouched for it in some way, whereas they hadn't taken that step. So there was this kind of, uh, academics like to talk about signaling all the time. Um, and so there was this kind of uh, signaling function that would, that would occur when, when the judge actually sent it, and the judge was now concerned that the signals were getting all confused because they weren't actually the ones who, who sent it. And you could imagine a system where a judge would write an opinion and say, you know, I, and I really mean it, or, and I don't really mean this. Um, but we probably wouldn't be all that happy with that system, but that's kind of what we had. Um, and it was working. It's, um, you know, the lawyers in the room know, know about legal fictions, and there was some kind of um, sort of legal fiction going on here. But we're through that. And so now what we have is all the opinions are out there. Any opinion can be cited, and it's up to the courts of appeal whether to give them precedential weight or not. Um, there was a lot of talk about how this, because of this information overload, there's way too much stuff out there. It would make litigation far too expensive, and, and of course, none of that happened. So what are judges worried about if the files of the courthouse are open, totally open to the public? They no longer have practical obscurity, but they would be open and searchable. Let's imagine a universe in which there was no PACER fee and in which you could just simply go to the federal court database and you could search very broadly. You could find out if anybody had ever filed for bankruptcy. You could find out whether anybody had ever pled guilty. You could find out whether their home had been searched. Uh, you could start trying to find out um, private information perhaps about their bank accounts, where they were, or their social security uh, numbers. 
So what are, what are judges worried about? Well, one thing the Congress was worried about and the courts are worried about is privacy, and that's, that's what I'm getting at. So social security numbers, plea agreements, the names of minors, uh, proprietary information. Some, so a lot of information obviously has value to competitors, uh, business competitors. Amnesty claims, for example, in an immigration case. There's just a whole host of areas in which the information is extremely sensitive. And it's, it's, it's not exaggerated to say that people will die as a result of going public. Um, people have died. Um, there are prisoners who've been killed as snitches, partly because they were snitches, um, and somebody found out on the database, and partly because they misunderstood what they were seeing in the database. And they assumed that if a plea agreement were sealed, then that meant the person was a snitch. And that's not necessarily the case. Some courts routinely seal plea agreements, and um, that word didn't get out, apparently, uh, to all of our um, prisoners and, uh, and, and people have died. The immigration cases are particularly tough. There's a huge amount of personal information in the immigration files. And to redact these files is extremely time consuming. And errors are, are very likely and occur all the time, as Carl can, will probably talk about. When, when if, you, if you were to audit the, the files in a courthouse, you would find many, many mistakes. And the mistakes are not made by the court the mistakes are made by the person who filed. In other words, the judge is responsible for what the judge uh, writes. And you would, if you were writing an opinion and you had to disclose somebody's social security number, you should follow the redaction procedures and the rules, which means that I think you only give the last four um, numerals of the social security number. But most of the filings, obviously, are by private parties, and many of the filings are by unrepresented parties, and they don't necessarily follow the rules. And if they don't follow the rules on redaction for privacy, then you have a lot of private information that's getting into the, into the records of the courthouse, and, and that's a problem, and it will always be a problem. Now, you could start spending money to deal with this. Each courthouse could be given an appropriation, and you could have people whose job it is to go through the records every day and using algorithms and other search techniques, try to, try to sanitize the records and, and be sure that they're in compliance. Judges can issue orders, can sanction lawyers, but you still have to deal with the fact that you have a lot of pro se litigants, that is people without lawyers, uh, poor people uh, who are not sanctionable as a, a practical matter, uh, who are filing things all the time. Uh, this is a huge portion of the um, courthouse clientele and getting bigger every day. And lawyers themselves don't, don't know how to do this and, and delegate it out to other people in their office, and it's very expensive. And there will be mistakes. So judges are worried about privacy. Judges are worried about distortion. Um, there's a gray male phenomenon. Uh, all litigation, uh, the transaction costs in litigation are so high that um, and trying to reduce those transaction costs is, is one of the goals of, of modern law reform. Uh, we want cases to be decided not so much on uh, the efficiency of the litigation, but on the justice of the underlying claim and, 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 and with reference to the, to the law that applies. That's the goal. That's the way most judges would view it. So when, a, when someone settles a case because they simply can't afford the litigation or think it's not worth the candle, um, I think most judges would say, gee, I mean, that's reality. Uh, we all do that, but it's kind of too bad. And if you could find a way to reduce that cost, that would be a good thing. And that's, this is neutral, I think, as to plaintiffs and as to defendants, although it's often the complaint of defendants. And, and the reason for that is that it's often the case that the plaintiff has actually very little in the way of discovery to turn over, and it's the defendant's records that are really the issue. And so it's the defendant who will bear the costs. Well, if you have a, if, if it's a weapon to actually load into the court system to make available to the world information which is embarrassing or potentially proprietary or somehow harmful to the defendant, 
then this becomes a, a, another lever in the litigation unrelated to the ultimate justice of the claims. And, and I think most, <coughs> most judges would be concerned about that because it distorts outcomes. And then finally, the cost. And I've, I've, I've spoken about that. I don't think we should underestimate that. Um, and let me just put the tension as strongly as I can. We're trying to build a litigation system, after all, which is open to as many people as possible at as low a cost as possible. And every time you say to somebody, well, you have to pay in addition to f simply filing the case and paying the filing fee and learning how to file in the courthouse and learning the law, you also have to pay now somebody to go through all your records and make sure they're redacted for privacy because of because they're going to be available to the entire world, and that could add potentially thousands of dollars to the cost of the litigation. That, that's a true cost, and we have, to, we have to take it into consideration. That doesn't mean we don't necessarily want to bear the cost, but it is a cost, and, um, and I think it's, it's, you know, it, should be of, it should be of concern. I, I think there's an amazing amount of agreement in this area, and so I'll be interested to, to hear what Carl has to say. Um, I felt that everything that I did as, as a judge should be f freely available, um, and that, that it, in effect it was. You go out into the courtroom and announce your opinion. You don't think that you've done this in private. And, the, and, and, and there, most judges would say that there should be no taint of anything smacking of secret law. But it's, it's, really, it's when we get into these other kinds of documents that are not court documents, but that are simply somebody made a decision to put them into the repository, almost as if I walked into the, into, um, the I almost said Stanford Law Library, but the Duke, where I spent many hours myself, or in the Duke Law Library and just said, you know, here, I have a box of books or records that I'd like you to hold for me. And it turns out it's defamatory or scurrilous or, uh, it's information that could be very, very hurtful to somebody else. I mean, that, that's the situation that we're in. And, um, and you can see it you know, from, from both sides, as is unfortunately so often the case. So thank you very much. <laughs>
it, it looms over the litigation and it can distort the outcome. So I would say that is a true concern, really quite a true concern. I think most things that have to do with you know, judicial control over the litigation, let us say, those tend to be overstated. Uh, there, there was a lot of consternation simply in, in that the, you, you will, this will resonate with you having been on a law faculty. You get a lot of crazy talk about how this will hurt or help different kinds of people depending on how uh, te technologically savvy they are. So when, when we went to CMECF, you would think that, gee, this is great for solo practitioners. Um, because they don't have to drive down to the courthouse anymore. And in a district like mine in, in Eastern California, you might be five hours from the courthouse. We thought we were making the system so much more accessible, particularly to small firms and to people without the resources. But they didn't see it that way. They, they saw this as this is going to benefit the big national firms because they'll understand how to do this. And little old me, you know, I'm still writing with a quill. And uh, just sort of like we have some professors who still use yellow pad and that sort of thing. Look, I brought a yellow pad. But, uh, you know, have, all, have their email printed out by somebody and then read back to them. Uh, and, you know, you, you sort of you go through these little sort of, I, I call them kerfuffles, you know. It's a slight um, disturbance of the force, but it's only slight. So I, I think the, the technological problems turn out to be overstated. Uh, the question of control turns out to be overstated. I don't think these privacy concerns are overstated, not, not at all. And, and, I, and I do fear the distorting effect. I think we see that a lot in litigation. Um, it depends on the litigation. Um, and I think that uh, the people that are going to mine this data are, are not, by and large, going to be people like uh, Carl and public interest groups, they are going to be commercial groups. Um, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I think we are already seeing this. You know, it's, it's the credit card companies. They, they really want to get into those bankruptcy files. Uh, they want to create, you know, better databases on, on people who uh, have filed in the bankruptcy system, their commercial uses. And, th and that's where a lot of this pressure is coming from. Yes, sir. I want to follow up on that a little bit for, not for lawyers, but for the public. Um, because I, what you said at the very beginning about, about the information is out there, but it's not really very accessible. And, and some, in, in some of this research that I've looked at, would say that that is a conscious barrier to public access to some of these records. And I'm wondering if there's any discussion about improving, the, and, and you touched on the, the website, bit, is the websites and yeah. the search mechanisms and, and the ways so, so that not just lawyers who feel uncomfortable with it, but the public can have better access to it. Is there any conversation about yes, that at all? There is. And, and this is so much better now. I, I, I have to tell you, when I started as a judge in the, in the 1990s, you could go into a courthouse and you wouldn't, the judges couldn't even tell you what, where to find a copy of the local rules or where the standing orders were for the court. And it was like, um, you know, you were just kind of waiting for uh, the anvil to fall on your head. It was like, oh my goodness, you know, you, you, you now found out that you violated some rule that you didn't, it wasn't easy to find out about. There was just maybe somebody in the clerk's office who knew about it. And, and all of that is now available. It's just, the websites need to be upgraded. I, I think that's true. And, uh, and there's talk about, um, I, I th there's going to be another iteration of electronic case filing. And when that happens in the next few years, apparently all the websites are going to be upgraded and they'll be, the opinions will be searchable. And uh, you'll see, I think, a huge increase in functionality and accessibility. But I don't know that there's any plan, if this is what you're asking, is to aggregate all of the opinions so, in other words, it, it, so that you wouldn't have to know which district the opinion was in, for example or which judge. Um, that, I, I, I don't know if there are plans for that, although I, I imagine that that could easily be done now. Maybe you've already done it. Um, I believe the Law Librarian of Congress is investigating the possibility of aggregating material, and I think that's one reason the Law Library is participating in, in the law.gov process. And, 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 and I think that would be wonderful. I think that would be great. I, I see no problem. Aggregating all the opinions of district judges and bankruptcy judges, magistrate judges, and appellate judges. I, I think a lot of lawyers will feel like, oh my goodness, there's a lot of stuff to look at. And there is, a, is something of a downside to that. It can, 
uh, it can increase the cost of litigation, but I think the benefits are clear. Yes. Uh, you mentioned reporters getting access to courthouses. The News and Observer has gone from 260 reporters to 100 uh, people in the newsroom in the last four years. When I asked the editor things that he wasn't able to cover anymore, the Durham court reporter for the News and Observer, that's, that was one of the beats that was eliminated. So a question like, um, how do judges in that courthouse treat gun crimes? Um, that's very hard right now for interest groups in Durham to examine. Would you um, be in favor of getting as much information as possible so that uh, in a low-cost way you could actually hold judges accountable? Yeah, I don't know that, um, that the data would necessarily permit you to do that. But, but if you're um, asking, would I, would I f it, 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 again, it requires aggregation. And if that can be done, um, you, know, you, have to, you have to decide how important it is and who's going to pay for it. Uh, you know, the courts, uh, it, no, no judge can do that, can't sit there and say, well, I'm just, you know, I've got this job of deciding cases, but in the night I will be a data aggregator. And there aren't, you know, Congress decides and appropriates. And, and if, they, if they appropriate monies for the administrative office of U.S. courts to aggregate that data, then I, I, I would think that would be fine. Now, you, the, the Sentencing Commission does some of this already. On the on the federal level, and 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 there's an argument on the on the other side for not doing it that you'll you'll hear from judges, um, so that if you if you were to if you said I want to see how Judge Levy sentenced in gun cases over the past ten years, uh, and publish that, um, some judges would say on the whole that's going to be distorting. Uh, you know that'll be you'll 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 end up with distorted information because. My cases are assigned to me randomly. I, you know, I, I don't know how long a judge, you'd, how long a time you'd have to be on the court to know whether you're you're getting a true random selection or whether that that they've been skewed in one way or another, and that you don't want to put pressure on judges in particular cases to to if they say, gee, you know, the public's keeping a scorecard on me, in so for, for a state court judge in in gun cases. And they want to see that I'm a stern sentencer in some parts of the country, or a lenient sentencer in in other parts of the country. Uh, that distorts the process. That's one of these areas where, um, if, where you, if you have an elected judiciary, you're you're starting to put pressure on your ju your judicial officers in that way. And you might not want to do that. I mean, it may happen anyway. Maybe it's just the way of the world, and we shouldn't have elected judicial officers. And I, I'm in favor of that as well. So. I, I would say if you're not going to have an elected judiciary then and like the federal system and if you have the federal system the more data that's out there I think you know the judges can take it they, they can they're, they're not going to be impeached because somebody thinks they were too lenient or not lenient enough at least I hope not thank you yeah thank you